Hey, Willow family, it is so good to be back with you again as we continue in our series in the book of Philippians. Um, I, uh, Pastor Dave did chapter two last week. I'm coming in with chapter three, and y'all know our homegirl is gonna be up next week bringing the heat on chapter four uh, of Pastor Megan. But, but this week, um, we're looking at chapter three. Now, I just don't know how they do. I, how, they give me a whole chapter and, and then give me just a few minutes of time. So we just gonna go as long as I want to today uh, and just turn the clock off. Dave, don't even worry about it. We just gonna get done when we get done. No, I'm playing. <laughs> We, we, go, we, go, we go handle it. But I, I do feel like chapter three is so rich. So if you haven't sat and read through the whole chapter, I won't have a chance to read through the whole chapter today, but sit with the whole chapter of chapter three. Paul, oh, he gives such great inspiration for how to hold on, how to hang in there, and how to remind us that Jesus is over everything. Jesus is above everything. I'll begin reading chapter three, verse 10. Uh, chapter three, verse 10, and I'll take it all the way to the end of the chapter. Hear these words of our dear brother Paul. Um, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, be, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Uh, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your word. I pray now that you would tune our ear to your voice so that we might hear you ever so clearly. Father, would you Stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you would have us say no and do. May the words of my mouth, the meditation in my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, you are my strength. You are my redeemer. Get glory in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul wants to get one thing over clear to us, and he wants to make sure that, it, that it's evident, and that is, Jesus supersedes everything. Jesus is over everything. He, he is an accomplished man. And as you look through chapter 13, you hear him and he'll say, yo, I got a resume unlike anybody else. I got a broad, thick resume, but you need to know as, as much as my pedigree is, my, my, my theological pedigree, my cultural pedigree, my Roman citizenship, it's all premium. I, 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 I am a high-end dude. I, I'm a big deal in culture, but he says, but it's all garbage. It's all trash, it's all, it's all dung. It means nothing in comparison to who Christ is in me. And he talks about a desire and a passion to know him. In our time together, I want you to walk away inspired, encouraged, and watch this, sobered by the reality that absolutely nothing in this world is more important and more significant 
than Jesus Christ and his lordship in your life. I'll do that. I'll give it to you again. I want you to walk away knowing that absolutely nothing in this world is more important. Nothing is more important than Jesus Christ and his lordship over your life. Jesus over everything. Some things know everything. A few things know everything. A quite a, some, uh, small things know everything. The big things know everything. Everything, 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 everything. Jesus over everything. Jesus is over everything. As we walk through, Paul helps us understand that, that Jesus, number one, it, he wants you to see that it's his purpose over your plan. It's, it's his purpose over your plan. He talks about his pedigree. He talks about all the things that he's accomplished, all the things that, all the plans that he has for his life. You need to know Jesus is over everything and his purpose is over your plans. His purpose is greater than your plans. I know that things that you want to do, the things that, that you got planned, the things that you put on your vision board, I'm telling you, Jesus' purpose is greater than your vision board. Jesus' is plan and his purpose is over everything. He says, what I want to do is I want to lay hold of that which is laid hold of me. Did did y'all see that? He says, I want to know Christ. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. Um, In verse 12, it says, "Not, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on toward the mark of that in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, But one thing I do is forgetting those things which are behind me. He says, I want to take hold of that which has taken hold of me. But in order for me to take hold of that Christ who's laid his hands on me, Christ has taken hold of me and he's given me purpose. He's taken hold of me and he's got a purpose and, and a plan for my life. He didn't take hold of me just to be nice to me. He took hold of me to change me. Do you understand? He didn't take hold of you just to be nice to you. He took hold of you to transform you and to change you. And he says, I want, I want to take hold of the one who's taken hold of me. Christ has taken hold of me and I want to take hold of him. And he says, and I realize in order for me to fully do that, one thing I got to do, and that's to forget those things which are behind me. Because I can't hold something new if I'm still holding on to those things that are old. I, I can't hold something new if I'm still holding on to those things that are old. In order for you to have his purpose over your plan, ultimately you got to let go of your plan so that you can make room for his purpose. Did you get that? Ultimately, you got to be willing to let go and surrender your plan so that you might make room for his purpose. We, um, in this quarantine uh, distance learning world, we decided to re- reshuffle some things in our house and we put all of our kids, well, at least three of our kids in the room. Our, our two-year-old is still in, in the nursery, but, but we have, we have uh, all three kids, 14, 12, and eight. We said, y'all gonna all room together um, and then the, the room that that frees up, we're gonna turn that into a classroom, which was my son Isaac's former bedroom. It was his bedroom. So we're ordering desks and getting the classroom and we ordering bunks and getting it all set up. And I go in and in, in the, the, it's weird. I, I, my son has got all of his stuffed animals all lined up and he's got a, looks like a little platform there. It's weird. I was like, what y'all doing in this room? And, and his sister's like, oh, Isaac just got done doing a funeral. What? What he's doing? Doing a funeral? What is he doing? And he says, oh, yeah, Dad, yeah, I did a funeral for my room. A funeral for your room? He said, yeah, I'm, about to, I'm losing my room, and I, so I had to say goodbye, so I decided to do a funeral for my room. Um, and, and we had a whole funeral, but I filmed it all, so you don't have to worry, Dad. You didn't miss anything. I filmed it all. So he films the funeral, and turns out Mickey Mouse did a eulogy. Uh, Black Panther was there. He shared words. And they talked about, I said, well, what were the eulogies about? He says, oh, we just talked about the good times we had. We talked about the, the memories, and we talked about those things that have, that have happened. And, and I just want to say goodbye so that I can get ready for the new room. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I think Isaac is on to something. I, I think we could all stand to learn something from young Isaac. There are some things in order to move on to the new thing, we should say goodbye to the old things. Paul says, I had to say goodbye to some stuff. 
I had to forget some things that are behind me because my, sh my future cannot be shaped by my past. I've got to be, my future, I've got to be healed from my past, not shaped by my past. I'll say that again. I've, I've got to be healed from my past, not shaped by my past, because if I take the hurt and the pain and the brokenness and the disappointments from my past and I try to receive the new, I won't have room for it. You got to be ready to receive God's purpose over your plan, and that means you got to let go of some things that are behind you. It's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday. Back in the 90s, Boys to Men, I'm telling you, that was the song. And whenever somebody passed away or whatever, you would go to Boys to Men, you would put on that song, and you would be sad for two days, and it just made everything right. All was right with the world. You, it was when you intentionally, when you want to be sad about death, put on It's So Hard. Because, because it is hard to say goodbye to yesterday. It's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday. Bishop Kenneth Ulmer, a mentor of mine, he said something to me the other day. He says, Albert, one place you never want to be is where God was. One place you never want to be is where God was. Sometimes I think we're stuck in yesterday and we need to recognize that God moves in seasons. And he might be trying to move us to the next season, but we're stuck in yesterday where God was. It's so hard. I'd encourage you, his purpose over your plan have a funeral. Invite God to heal from yesterday. I'm not saying ignore yesterday. Let me, let me just clear that up. I ain't saying ignore it. I'm not saying excuse bad behavior of yesterday. I'm not saying excuse abuse. I'm not saying excuse and give. No, 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 no. I'm saying so that you might experience the fullness of where God has for you. you. You are a video, not a Polaroid. Don't you get stuck in one shot of your story. It's a video. He kept writing. He kept filming. There's something in the future. Don't you get stuck being a Polaroid, being a snapshot when you are a video. Your story keeps going. Don't get stuck in a picture of your past. Walk in the fullness of the video of your future. God's writing his purpose. And it's over your plan. It's over your plan. Second thing, second thing, Paul, ooh, this is so good. The second thing Paul wants you to see is that it's his kingdom over this world. G Jesus wants us to understand. Paul, Paul is saying, you need to understand this about God. You need to understand this about Christianity. It's about his, his plan, his purpose over your plan, his kingdom over your world, Jesus over everything, his kingdom over your world. He talks about, he says, for those of you that are mature, you should, you should view things in this way. Uh, you, you should see that it's this idea as a, I'm pressing on toward the mark for this greater prize, this high calling, which is in Jesus Christ. And I love it around verse 17. He says, join together in following my example. He says, do as I do. Watch, watch me. Watch my example. For as I have often told you before, and I now tell you, hear the emotion with tears in my eyes. Many people live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Here it is, watch this. He says, the problem with the folks of this world, the things of this world, and what I need you to see is that their eyes and their minds and their hearts are set on earthly things. They're overly consumed with the things of this world and they need to be overly consumed with the things of my kingdom. His kingdom over this world. Some of us, are we are enemies of the cross because we are so in love and so consumed with the pleasures, the comforts of this world. When God didn't call us to comfort, he called us to kingdom. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. We, we should be focused in ushering in. Paul is saying, you got to keep your mind focused on the kingdom of God, on things eternal, because the temporal things of this world will cause you to miss the fullness of God. You live by the God of your stomach. You live, by, you live on a path that would ultimately take you to your, to, to your destruction. He says, this world is not our home. Our prize is heavenward. Our goal is heavenward. Our reach is heavenward. Not, not, 
Not, not just when we die. That is that. But no, heaven would now as it is in heaven. That kingdom come on earth now as it is in heaven. He wants us to reach for, for this heaven, heavenward goal now that we're on earth. What is he saying? He's saying my kingdom can break into this earth and break into this world right now. You need to see my kingdom over this world right now. Roman, Roman citizens would know this better than most. As Paul is talking, he says, but our, verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there. He, he's saying basically, as you walk around this world, you need to walk around knowing that your citizenship is not in the things of this world. So the things of this world should feel, here it is, foreign to you. It should feel distant. It should feel, it should feel far off. You, sh you shouldn't feel too comfortable because I'm not a citizen here. I'm not from here. I am from uh, the heavenly, heavenly realm. I've got citizenship in another place. As a Roman citizen, they would, they would go and they would take over colonies and they, they'd build colonies and they have these Roman colonies all across different places of the world and they would, it would take on, it would take on, um, uh, uh, a Roman uh, imagery, Roman architecture, Roman design. It, they, they would take over colonies. And so a Roman citizen could really walk anywhere in the world because Rome was so big and so bad and so influential and had so much power. A Roman citizen would walk in a place that was foreign, but they'd walk as though they owned the place because they had a citizenship that had authority over all those colonies. I, I guess what Paul is saying, you should walk in this foreign world with a sense of confidence of knowing that your citizenship is in heaven and your citizenship is in a place where there is all power. There's all power. Um, I remember going to, to Africa and uh, I was in Kenya and, and I'm there and I'm navigating. It's a foreign country. I hadn't traveled internationally very much at all. So everything is just kind of different. I feel uncomfortable. I feel, it's like, oh, you know, and, 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 and I, I remember them, taking us by the U.S. Embassy. <laughs> and, and I didn't know how the embassy thing worked. I, I don't know if you, you've seen it, but the embassy works as though the United States in, in Africa, Kenya, they made an agreement that um, the United States will have embassy, will have residents, will have, have a place in Kenya that is in fact the United States so that when our citizens are there, they can come to the embassy. And when you come to the embassy, you are in fact standing on US soil, although you are in Kenya. All of the laws and regulations and the authority and the influence of America is embodied right here in this embassy in Kenya. I said, no, wait a minute, let me get this straight. So although I'm in Kenya, I'm on U.S. soil. They said, yes, this is America. So if you get in trouble or if you have legal problems or if you get lost or you can't find your passport, you come here to America and all the rules and authority and legislation that applies in America applies here at this embassy as though it was America, although you are in Kenya. I said, wait a minute. I don't get this. Wait a minute. So if I want to get on U.S. soil, I'm standing on U.S. soil right now. Yes. Although I'm in Kenya, yes, because the rule and reign of America comes and has authority right here, although it's it's in Kenya, it has authority of American soil and legislation and rule and authority right here. Oh, if you get it early, I won't have to preach as long. I'm telling you, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. We have a citizenship in heaven, the kingdom of God, but the kingdom has broken in and we walk in the kingdom embassy of the glory of God. So we who are sons and daughters, when we usher in the reign and the glory and the kingdom of God, we we walk under the authority, the influence, the, the rule and the reign of the kingdom of God. So although I'm in Southern California in a building where the air condition is broke and I'm sweating like crazy, although I'm in Southern California, I'm also standing in the kingdom of God, the rule, the reign, the authority of God. Although you may be in a house that's struggling with brokenness, I'm telling you as the beloved son and daughter of the kingdom of the most high, you can say thy kingdom come, thy will be done in this house as it is is in heaven. We are ambassadors and we've got an embassy here on earth. Paul says your citizenship is not in this world. Your citizenship ain't in Illinois. It ain't in, in Chicago. It ain't in Barrington. It ain't in downtown. Your citizenship is in heaven. So act like where you're from. Act like a citizen of heaven. Don't you get too dependent upon this world because his kingdom is over this world. 
his purpose over our plan, his kingdom over this world. <laughs> Lastly, the end of chapter three, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Paul, Paul closes chapter three, here are the big rocks. He says, I have plans for my life. They're all garbage. I surrender them all for God's purpose for my life. I live in this world. I see the influence of this world. I see the detriment of this world. I see the evil in this world, but I don't fear this world because I'm in this world, but I'm not of it. I've got a different citizenship. So he says, act like where you're from. Walk like a citizen of the kingdom of God and usher in that kingdom, that citizenship, walk in the authority and the power of that citizenship everywhere you go. Some of you are walking in some hard places. I'm telling you, walk like a citizen of the kingdom of God. Some of you are going through some very hard times right now. I encourage you, walk like a citizen from the kingdom of God. And then thirdly, he rounds third, he rounds third and he heads for home. Listen to this with emotion. Hear the emotion. He says, we're waiting. And he says this in part because he says, what I'm talking about ain't going to be easy. Can I just tell you, I'll be less than a preacher if I tell you Jesus over everything, living this thing out, it ain't easy. Because we are in a world where there's brokenness. We are in a world where there's devastation. We are in a world where there's heart, heartache, and disappointment. Many of us have cried more tears lately than we ever have. Paul, I'd imagine dealing with infirmity in his own body. He says, we, are, we all waiting on Jesus. Because when he comes, he's going to make all things better. And he says, he's going to deliver us from these lowly bodies. These, the, the translation there is this, this idea of these, these disappointing, failing, ailing bodies. These, these, these bodies that, that are getting harder. Some, some young folks won't be able to connect with this, but some of you do. Some of us, we live with ailment, ailment in our bodies. With coronavirus, with COVID, some of us, we live in fear because we have pre-existing conditions. So as for some people, this is a light issue and it's not that big of a deal. Some of us, we literally fear death because of what's going on in our bodies. Some of us, like Paul, it has been a physical infirmity that God has used to awaken a spiritual, a spiritual burden. Some of us, we, we live with chronic pain. We live with chronic illness. Paul says, even with that, God's plan for your glorious body is over your plan for this earthly body, his body, his glorious body over our earthly body. He says with tears in his eyes, he says, we're waiting and God's going to come. Everything's going to be under his control and he will transform these lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Can I just encourage you? God is going to make all things new. The reason why his plans are greater than ours is because he's going to make all things new. He's going to redeem all things, even our bodies. Now, I know for some that's not a big deal, but for many, can I just tell you? For many, we're waiting on new bodies because you're starting to feel the ailment of this one. For many of us, we... Um, we struggle with the body. And we're saying, God, heal us. Paul is saying, even for that, God's got a plan. He's got a glorious body that'll be greater than the body of this old world. He's going to renew all things. 
his purpose over your plan, his kingdom over this world, his glorious body over this earthly body. There's a story of a, of a dad and his young son, and this dad, had he was a lover of cars. He used to restore cars, and he came along with his, his dream truck. It was this old truck, decades and decades old, but he wanted to rebuild it. But he was a guy, he's an engine guy. He wasn't in the, uh, the exterior things, like the, the paint job and the leather seats. And, uh, he didn't care nothing about that. He was a, mo- a muscle motor guy. He, he wanted to make sure that that engine, so he rebuilt that engine, put in new parts, and he just... He was, he was about speed and the purr, the sound of that engine. He invested, he got that engine to where it was flawless. It was flawless. His son would sit out in the garage with him and pass him this and pass him a wrench and pass him little, little things. And, and that boy never thought he'd ever get the chance to drive his daddy's most precious possession. So he'll never forget the day his dad looked at him and said, boy, I'm gonna give you the keys. You take her for a drive. He says, wow, dad, are you, are you serious? He says, yep, go by yourself. Have, have a good time. Be careful, but have a good time. The boy got the keys. He couldn't believe it. Vroom, vroom, vroom. The, and then that engine just roared. He got that thing crunk up. Then he went driving. <laughs> then the first 30 minutes of the drive, somebody came and hit him. Messed the truck up. He couldn't even drive it. One of the worst things he's ever, one of the hardest things he's ever done in his life was calling his dad and saying, Dad, somebody hit me in your truck. I think what was more surprising is his father's response than anything else. He said, Now, son, first question he asked, are you okay? He says, yeah, Dad, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm good. It's just your truck, Dad, your truck. He says, don't worry about it. Listen, call the tow truck. You have them come pick up the truck. And son, listen to these instructions. When that tow truck driver gets there, you call me and you don't have him do nothing till you put him on the phone with me. He said, okay, Dad, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. He says, that's all right, just listen to my instructions. He says, okay, so he gets there, he calls him back, he says, Dad, he says, yeah. He says, Dad says, is the, tow, is the driver there? He says, yeah, Dad, here he is right here. And he goes, hello, sir. Yes, I'm the tow truck driver. He says, now, 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 now sir, listen to me and listen to me good. That truck is one of my most prized possessions. Now, that body's all messed up. But that engine, that, that's the soul of that truck. You, I'm telling you, I don't care what you do with that body of that truck, but you take that engine out. You bring that engine home to me. I don't care what you do with that body, but you bring that soul home to me. You see where I'm going here? Paul is saying one day, our heavenly father is going to make a call towards this old world. And he's going to say, world, you can have that old body, but that soul You bring it home to me because I've got a brand new body for. I've got a glorious body. Oh, him used to say, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Jesus over everything. His purpose is over your plan. His kingdom is over this world. And he's got a glorious body that's over this earthling vessel in this world that we live in. Now God's got a plan. He's redeeming all things as we fight and as we reach and as we press on toward the goal. Don't you forget in this world, Jesus is over everything for his glory. Amen.